so welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Carly Baldwin. I'm a physical therapist here at UCSF Goodyam Children's Hospital Sports Medicine Center for Young Athletes. And tonight we're going to be talking about baseball. Um, just a couple housekeeping things. If uh, you're on a mobile phone, you will not be able to see me, but you can hear me and you can see my slides. It's okay. Everything that's on the slide is things that I'll probably be going over if you're watching YouTube. So you can flip back and forth if you're on a computer. So, a little bit about where I work. We love working with young athletes. In fact, that's all we do, is we specialize in working with young athletes. We have three uh, clinics, San Ramon, Walnut Creek, and then Oakland, which is the campus I work at. At the end of this presentation, I'm gonna be giving you some resources for coaches, parents, and athletes in case you have questions of how to contact me, and I can direct you to either one of my colleagues or answer the question myself. I'm also going to be giving you a couple other resources to go to that you can share with your teammates and other athletes and parents. So, back to baseball. What is so great about baseball? I asked myself this question about 10 years ago when I met and then married a so proclaimed baseball addict. Over the past 10 years, I've come to love the sport and enjoy it, but more importantly, I really love um, working with the athletes. And if you were to ask 10 different people why they love baseball, you'd probably get a different response. My response is, I really like the mechanics of it. I really like working with the shoulder and the elbow. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So what makes baseball unique? Well, the Super Bowl just happened. If you were to see Tom Brady throw a football, he would throw it at about 2,300 degrees per second. If you were to watch a baseball player, particularly a pitcher, Pitch, they'd be at 7,500 degrees per second. That's huge. It is the fastest, the highest velocity demands on the shoulder and elbow out of any sport. If I were to hold my elbow up and throw at that speed, it would essentially be 20 times going around in a circle in, a, in, in one second. So, as you could imagine, that puts a lot of stress on our bodies. There's a lot of information on this page there's some pretty cool pictures. These are the different phases of a pitch. What I really want the take home to be on this uh, particular slide is when we're having the most stresses and the biggest um, issues in our throws. So um, in the late cocking phase is when you're gonna have the greatest degree of abduction and external rotation. That's when you're coming into acceleration, which is when most injuries happen. Not to be outdone, the deceleration phase also has a tremendous amount of stress on the shoulder. So much so that it's one-to-one -one with, with the athlete's body weight. This comes into play later too when we talk about not just upper body uh, injuries, but why it's important to keep the core and the lower extremities um, strong. So a little bit about youth sports in the U.S. Currently there's 60 million athletes between the ages of 6 and 18 who participate in organized athletics. Um, 27 million are in team sports and 44 million participate in more than one sport. What does that mean to us? Well, 2 million of those athletes are going to suffer an injury. Probably actually more than that because a lot of these uh, athletes don't necessarily report their injuries. The part that I really want you to see is the red part. Half the injuries are overuse injuries. And that's what we're really going to try to target tonight and make sure it doesn't happen. Because as much as I like working with these athletes, I want to keep you out of the clinic and keep you healthy so that you have long careers. Since 2000, shoulder and elbow injuries have increased by 500% in baseball and softball players. That is humongous, and it goes back to those overuse injuries. Oh, and 45% of youth that play baseball are, more, are going to at some point experience arm pain. I bring this up only because that's half of your players almost. So injury specific to pediatrics. Really the top two are little league shoulder and little league elbow. That's what we're going to go over tonight. Um, the shoulder injuries, the slap tears are also things that are a little bit more serious and specific. We're not going to go into the great details, but something to be aware of. Growth plate injuries are really kind of what we're going to target and talk about. UCL injuries and Tommy John injuries. These are injuries that it's a big buzzword to talk about Tommy John, but in our young athletes, they should not be common. This should be an anomaly, not something that we're seeing as often that, as we are. Uh, I want to highlight on the right-hand column, concussions. 
We have a concussion program here, and we're going to be having another webinar series and a live um, series on concussion, as well as at our conference this weekend. Concussions are huge in youth um, sports right now. It's important as a coach, as a parent, and as a player to understand um, the different parameters around caring for a concussion, recognizing a concussion, so that we can best care for these athletes. So although we're not going to talk about it tonight, I would encourage you to go to that webinar or go to that conference as well. So the growth plate. If you look at this picture, this is a really cool picture. There's two things that um, I want to highlight. This is an elbow. The elbow, we talk a lot about the inside part of the elbow and how it has a lot of stress to it, a lot of tensile stress. But the elbow can experience two different types of stresses. Not only are we doing a, um, a tension stress, but a compression stress as well. So it's getting it from both directions. Our growth plates are highlighted in the blue and white areas. These are at the fissures. Um, it's kind of a funny word to say. But <laughs> growth plates don't usually close until 19 to 22 years old. Um, if you're lucky, they might not close until you're 25. What this really tells us is kids, children, adolescents, they're not small adults. They're still growing and they're still evolving. And we need to respect that and respect the growth plates and understand that they are there. Um, the reason that we need to respect them and understand them there is that they're the most vulnerable um, places for injuries, especially in baseball players. This is where the bone develops, and at the apophysis is where the tendon actually attaches. So you're much more likely for the tendon to pull and yank a piece of the bone off at the growth plate than you are to actually have a tendon injury. So these are things that we need to be aware of. Um, this is what most of our athletes are going to be experiencing and what we're going to see them for. It's a little weak shoulder. It's an overuse injury. It's stressed to the top part of the arm of the humerus, and it's where there's actually a widening, widening of the growth plate. So if I go back a couple slides real quick, that left picture where the arrow is, that's a fracture, and that's not the growth plate. And you can see it go all the way across. Um, the athlete's going to commonly experience what we call dead arm arm just feels like it's not moving, it's not well. Um, it's usually a gradual onset, and the player is going to report that it happens most often once they're going into increased velocity of throw. So it might not be all the time. It's going to be most common in our players who are experiencing growth, so 11 to 14, when they're doing those big growth spurts. On average, the symptoms last about eight months. Causes for instability or what might be prerequisites to Causing an injury like this are functional to throwing. Cuff weakness, scapular dysfunction, and core strength weakness. We're going to talk about all of these things a little bit more in depth. Elbow injuries. Again, I go back to the Tommy John because everybody wants, anyone who plays baseball or who watches baseball has probably heard about Tommy John before. UCL injuries should not be common in our youth population. Why? Because um, the physis is much weaker than the UCL the ligament itself. So throwing does increase tensile stresses and compressive forces, as we talked about in that previous picture. But really what we're going to be more concerned is medial epicondylar um, apophysitis. It sounds a lot to say, a big word. What does it really mean? Well, it just means that there's pain on the inside of the elbow or the medial part of the elbow. Things you're going to watch for for these athletes and when they have pain. So it's, again, going to be gradual. They're going to start having a decrease in throwing velocity and accuracy. Um, the big thing that I think should be noted here is decrease in grip strength. So you might not notice the first two or the, the first couple of uh, symptoms here, but they start complaining that they're having a hard time gripping the ball, or even worse, they're having a hard time gripping their pencil at school. Those are things that are concerning. Um, of course, it could be tender to palpate. There's going to be motion loss and then pain where they actually can't get to the end part of um, the range of motion. I want to note just something about young athletes. A lot of times they're a lot tougher than they seem and they might not tell you they have an injury. So things like grip strength and noticing that they're having a harder time keeping track of the ball and holding the ball or they're reporting those types of symptoms are important because they might not tell you they're in pain. They would still want to play. So uh, fractures near the apophysis are, are common, and that's where we're, we're worried about the growth plates. But there's also two other conditions I want to note, and that's Panner's disease, which is in athletes younger than 10 years old, and it's a prerequisite where it's actually really the same thing as osteochondritis defecans, which is 
greater than 13 years, and what it is is the blood supply to the bone um, starts to decrease and it can cause essentially bone death. So we want to recognize these things early so we can treat it early and so we can get these players back to being healthy and then back to play. The female athlete. I put this in because there's more and more girls. As you can see in the picture, it's Monet Davis at the 2014 Little League World Series. There's more female athletes that are coming through the ranks. 1,200 girls and out of, I think there's 500,000 um, players for uh, high school baseball. It might not seem a lot, but I looked, I searched for the statistic on how many are in Little League, and there isn't one. So there's going to be more athletes coming through the ranks. This is something as a parent and a coach you should recognize and be aware of, because they do have some unique um, injuries that are a little bit different than their male counterparts. They're going to be a little bit more lax in their ligaments. Um, they develop a lot quicker than their male counterparts, and so sometimes they might be bigger, faster, stronger, but it doesn't mean that they're done growing, and so they're going to be a little bit more vulnerable, too, in that stage for some of these birthday injuries. Knee injuries, particularly ACL injuries, are four to six times more likely in a female athlete. And then lastly, the female athletic triad. It's unlikely you'll see this in baseball. Um, typically, athletes that experience this are um, gymnasts, dancers, rowers, athletes where low body weight is something that's desired. However, given that baseball is a male dominant sport, there's some psychosocial components that might make this a factor. And I wanted to make a coach or a parent who has a female athlete aware of it. Um, just recognizing the signs of someone who might have disordered eating, low bone mass, um, and then lastly, uh, uh, anamenorrhea or loss of disease. So this was put, a campaign that was put out by Stop Sports Injuries a couple of years ago. Um, they're one of the resources I will be giving coaches. They're leaders in trying to get information out to coaches, players, and parents um, so that we have a set of regulations for planes so that we're not going into those overuse injuries, which brings me to our risk factors and recommendations. This is put on by the American Sports Medical Institute and Pitch Smart. You might ask, why should I believe ASMI, a whole bunch of letters? Who are these people and why should I believe them? Dr. James Andrews out of Birmingham, Alabama put this group together. Um, it's filled with researchers, biomechanists, physical therapists, and physicians. They are leaders in their field. If you look up anything from Dr. Andrews, you're going to see tons of information about baseball, elbows, and shoulders. Uh, he wrote a book called Any Given Monday. It's a great book if anyone is interested in some light reading. It's a, it's a good one on sports and athletes, uh, young athletes in America. Pitch Smart is something that Dr. Andrews then put together along with MLB. It's comprised of physicians from almost every major league team. So these guys know their stuff. They really are the experts in the field. So we should listen to them as we're working with these younger athletes on what we should be looking for as risk factors to prevent injuries and then what their recommendations are. First recommendation, pitching when fatigued. This seems like a no-brainer. Seems like, yeah, I should be able to recognize when a pitcher's fatigued. A pitcher who continues to pitch 36 times, more likely to injure their throwing elbow or shoulder. There's three different types of fatigue. We're going to go over all three of these because they fall into their own risk factor categories. But first, I want to go over how to recognize fatigue. So we already talked about in the little weak shoulder and little weak elbow, decreased ball velocity, decreased accuracy. These are kind of red flags. Something's up. Um, this is definitely a red flag for fatigue. But there's something that's a little bit more subtle that you might not notice right away. And that could be an altered trunk pattern that they're standing more upright. They're using more accessory muscles versus actually throwing um, with proper mechanics having a dropped elbow, these are a little simple things that can signal this pitcher needs to be relieved. Um, increased time between pitches and definite pauses in play could also be another sign of fatigue. Risk factors. Throwing greater than 100 innings in a year. This is what we categorize as seasonal fatigue. These athletes are 3.5 times more likely to be injured by throwing more than 100 per year. So what's the recommendation? Seems like it'd be simple. Less than 100 innings per year, right? 
Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Really, that 100 uh, innings per, uh, per year only categorizes from the 13 and up category. If an athlete is 12 and under, it should actually be less. So 9 to 12 year olds, it should be 80 combined innings pitched in one year. For 8 and under, even less than that, 16. And for our under 12 athletes, there's a little bit of an extra precaution that goes into it. Pitchers, once removed from the mound, should not return as a pitcher to a game. For our 13 through 18 year olds, so junior high through high school, a pitcher can be removed from the mound and they can return one additional time in a game, but that's it. And then our college age athletes, they have their kind of own restrictions and there starts to be a little bit more leniency. So not enough time off, year-round fatigue. Um, specialization in sports in America is becoming more and more common. Dr. Pandia last year gave a really good lecture on this. I don't know if he'll be giving it again this weekend, um, but it, it's something that is becoming an ongoing issue. Kids wanting to specialize earlier and earlier. The research shows competing more than eight months out of a year, you're, more, you're five times more likely to have surgery. So the recommendation is take at least two to three consecutive months off a year. Four months is really preferred from any overhead throwing. Um, that includes, it could be overhead volleyball, it could be um, tennis, it could be uh, quarterback for the football team, it could be water polo. These are all what we consider overhead sports. Um, the preference is four months off completely from competitive baseball pitching. There's so many other ways you can train. You can be training on footwork. You can be training core and lower body. You can be training strengthening. So just because we're saying, hey, take some time off from pitching or take some time off from throwing doesn't mean that you still can't be training. I think that's important for a young athlete to understand that pitching more, throwing more isn't going to make you bigger, better, faster, stronger. Taking some time off is a valuable lesson and a valuable thing for an athlete. So throwing overuse and pitching on consecutive days. These go hand in hand, and this is why our pitch count uh, was formed, and it's going to be the next slide. I'm going to go ahead and move on to that because it's a lot of information, and I just want people to be able to look and recognize the age groups and how many pitches um, someone should have as a daily max and how many days rest they should have in between. I put at the bottom of this page the resource. This is on uh, all of the resources I give you at the end, so it's easy to access like this for your team, but there are recommendations for pitch counts and rest days for the very reason that you're increasing your risk for injury the more pitches you do um, and the more time you continue to play without having rest. So excessive throwing. We just talked about that with pitch count, but pitchers who also play catcher are putting themselves at a higher risk. Um, for having injury as well, simply because they're throwing more. So the recommendation is a pitcher should not also be a catcher for their team. These are really two very specialized uh, positions as well. So at that point, you really should be kind of thinking one or the other. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. There we go. There we go. All right. So the next risk factor has to do with throwing mechanics. This page has a whole bunch of asterisks on it, including Barry Bonds' um, home run ball, because we love asterisks in baseball. Poor throwing, throwing mechanics, it used to be the rule was you can't throw a curveball until you can shave. And I put those numbers up there and those age recommendations up there. And it's not that we don't still give this as a recommendation. However, research has shown there's no significant difference between the fastball and the curveball and kinetic stresses on the elbow and shoulder when performed correctly. And the caveat there is when performed correctly. So the most recent study was done June 2016. They took little leaguers, high school athletes, junior high athletes, college players, and professional players, and they had them throw the ball. And they looked at if there's any increased stress, and there wasn't. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't still have some precautions, which is what the next page is going to be. So the recommendation is learn good throwing mechanics as soon as possible. The first step should be basic throwing, then fastball, then change up. A pitcher should really, if they're more advanced, have three good pitches that they're very good at, they have sound mechanics on. 
if they're just starting out, start with the basics. Really make sure that they're using good mechanics, and that includes the trunk and the lower body, not just the shoulder and elbow. So looking at the whole picture. Using a radar gun. It's so tempting, right? You want to see how fast that you're throwing. You want to um, give that immediate visual feedback to your athlete. By using a radar guard, you really are creating this temptation to throw harder. You might not be using the same sound mechanics that you would if it wasn't there. So the recommendation is to not, or to use it sparingly. Additional risk factors and the recommendations are just don't do it. Playing on multiple teams with overlapping season. Really the reason you don't want to do this is it increases the amount of times that you're throwing. And you might have one really great coach, or as a parent, you might be watching it on one team and really keeping a good eye on how many pitches and following all the right precautions. Then you have this other team, and it just gets a little bit too convoluted. So you are increasing your risk by playing on multiple teams, especially if they're overlapping. Poor safety precautions at showcases. Again, this kind of goes hand in hand with the radar. There's this huge temptation to start overthrowing, to show off and mechanics go out the window, safety goes out the window. Plus, there's that whole adrenaline factor where a young athlete is super excited to kind of show off and they don't really realize, I kind of have some pain, or I'm just going to play through it, I'm just a little sore. So these are all things to, to be aware of. Pitching while injured, this one's a favorite of mine because it includes lower extremity injuries as well. It might seem like it's just, a, it's just you know, I rolled my ankle, it's just an ankle. What does that really have to do with throwing? Well, if we go back to that slide where it had all the different phases of throwing, talked about how at one point you're one-to-one -one with your body weight. So it requires a lot of single leg balance, a lot of core stability, a lot of lower body strength. If you have a um, rolled, sprained ankle, that's going to affect how you throw. If you have a hip injury, if you have a back injury, those are all going to play a factor on how you're playing. So it might not seem like it directly affects your shoulder and elbow, but it's important to recognize that all injuries are injuries and to treat them accordingly. Poor strength and conditioning, hopefully we solved this issue tonight, but that definitely puts you at increased risk. So I really like this picture. This is not one of the guidelines set forth, but it's just something I think that is really um, important for parents and players and coaches to be aware of. Athletes who develop earlier, these two athletes, um, both play in the Little League World Series, both did phenomenally. But you can see there's a huge difference between the two sides of this. Kids who tend to develop quicker get picked to play more. They get picked to play harder, faster, stronger, because they are bigger and um, seemingly stronger. It's important to note that they have these strong muscles with open growth plates, which means they still have a high risk to be injured. So not overusing those bigger, stronger athletes just because they have developed quicker. All right, so the recommendation overall should be a no-brainer, but oftentimes we let some of these other factors get in the way. And that should be, we should be inspiring young athletes to be young athletes and to enjoy the game. Burnout um, is huge. With the earlier that we're allowing athletes to specialize, the higher rate that we're allowing them to burn out in the sport. Let's just teach them to really love the sport and have good mechanics so that they can have um, a really successful long career. How to identify overuse. I like this slide because, again, I talked a little bit about it earlier. Sometimes the players, not it's not that they're not being honest with you, but they might not have ever experienced pain. They might want to play through the pain because they love the game. They have friends on the team. They might not tell you that they're hurting. So the first two stages are the stages that you might not know about. They're having pain after physical activity. And maybe it's just, you know, I'm kind of sore. I don't know if it's overuse. I don't know if it's, I just threw really hard today. I don't know what it is, but I'm sore. The second is pain during activity, but it's not really restricting their performance. And you'll get this a lot. You'll get, um, I get athletes who will come into the clinic and say, well, you know, I'm not really hurting right now. I just kind of wanted to get it checked out because it hurts just when I throw. But it doesn't really hurt any other time. I don't really think I'm injured. Then you get to the last two steps, and that's when they're in the clinic and you're saying, all right, I think you're going to have to take some time off. Because now they're having pain that actually restricts their performance. They're like, I can't throw as hard. I can't throw as accurately. I have to take more breaks. And lastly, they're having chronic 
remitting pain, even at rest. They're telling you, you know, it really hurts when I'm writing at school. It hurts when I'm typing. I can't rest on my elbow or my shoulder. It's waking me up in the middle of the night. These are concerning. The quicker we can identify these things, preferably in those first two stages, the quicker we can help the athlete. When to seek a medical um, advice and attention, and hopefully you're doing this before the, the three and four stages of that last slide, if the pitcher or any kind of athlete, not just pitching, uh, complains of pain in the elbow or shoulder, you should be discontinuing pitching or playing until they're further evaluated. Um, pain that persists for more than two weeks, and I'd say even if it's not just at rest, it says despite rest, but pain that's persisting for two weeks, you should immediately get evaluated. Pain that continues to get worse, swelling, or not just swelling, um, but even just heat, they're telling you it feels kind of hot, loss of motion, and then limping. And the limping piece goes back to even lower extremity injuries affect our overhead athletes. So how do we prevent these injuries? Well, um, hopefully we're doing something that I'm calling prehab um, before we're doing rehab. Prehab and rehab look really similar. Prehab is, this is what we're doing to keep athletes out of the clinic. Rehab is what they're doing once they are in the clinic. They're not all that different in terms of what our overall goals are, it's just the execution might be a little different. The first is we have to make sure that we have normalized tissue, that we have the right amount of mobility. The second, we need to make sure that they're strong. Are we having good balance between the different muscles that function and allow the shoulder to move how it's supposed to move? Third, we need dynamic stability. So an athlete's shoulder, when they're throwing, should be able to take different degrees of force. They should be able to turn quickly. They should be able to move quickly and handle um, different factors that come their way. That's that dyna dynamic stability piece. That it's not just in a static position or a controlled environment. That we can put them in any environment and they're still going to be stable. And lastly, function. And that function piece is those higher level skills, throwing and mechanics. And that's really where we're asking the coaches to get involved. We're doing more of those first three in the clinic, and then at that last part where we're getting back to throwing and mechanics, that's when we're turning it over to the coaches and going to our pitching experts, going to the coaches who are um, well seasoned in that and asking for their advice and having our athletes go back to them. The thrower's paradox. This was first coined by a physical therapist named Kevin Welp. And what it is, is that the shoulder has to be mobile enough to allow excessive external rotation We've seen these still shots throughout the presentation today, but it's something that you see if you watch any baseball game. You can see the athlete can really get their shoulder back. It's obvious when you watch someone throw a baseball who is not a baseball player. Why? They don't have that motion. So you need to have excessive external rotation, um, but you also need to be stable enough to prevent subluxation. So we talked about the shoulders moving at 7,500 degrees per second. The shoulder still needs to stay attached to the body and not come flying off. So we have to be mobile, but we also have to be stable. The young athletes um, that play baseball are really great because they kind of have this unique thing about them. They have an adaptive change that happens in their body that's unique to their sport. So the humeral head actually changes how it sits in its um, um, fossa. Uh, the reason being is these athletes are starting before they hit puberty, so they're growing, growth bits are still open, the shoulder has to get more external rotation, so the shoulder adapts and moves to a different direction. The bone actually adapts and you get this bigger degree of external rotation. Once the growth plates close, it's not going to change, it's going to stay there. Now the soft tissue that's around it that keeps it stable, the soft tissue that's tight, um, those things can be restored. But the joint itself, the bone itself, it's going to stay that way. So the first of the recommendations for how we can prevent these injuries is doing a dynamic warm-up. This is a way to keep an athlete really mobile. Any athlete that goes through our doors here at the clinic, we have them do a dynamic warm-up. Why? because it's a really efficient way of getting blood flow to the body. It has so many uh, physiological benefits, many that are on this slide, and the ones that are on this, this slide are very specific to baseball players. 
um, Results Physical Therapy up in Sacramento has done a lot of work on this and has developed a baseball specific dynamic warm up that we're going to show you next. Um, but it's a good way, we used to do a lot of those static stretches and that wasn't really effective. This is a really good way of getting the body to prepare for sport. So here's the active baseball warm up. I'm going to just kind of stick on the slide so that you can really take a good look at it. Um, you want to start by allowing your athletes to do just a nice, easy job, nice warm up. So what that would look like is you're going to have them go to the foul poles and back. Then you're going to have them do some specific form running. That's your high knees, your butt kickers, your Frankensteins, um, your side shuffles, your karaoke. And then it's going into these series of different stretches. But these are not your, hey, hold for 30 second stretches. You're going to be doing five reps on each. You're going through the full range of motion of the joint. You're going to be pulling into a quad stretch. You're going to be going into a lunge with an overhead reach. You're going to go into a side lunge, a catcher squat. And then lastly, it's called an inverted T, but this could also be called like a single leg deadlift or um, whatever term, other term you want to form it. These are all ways to prepare the body, especially the lower body, for getting ready for running, for getting ready for doing everything that you need to do on the field. This should happen before every practice and every game. The bottom drills are called the two out drill. I'm going to be doing another slide on this so you get this twice. But again, I wanted to kind of stick on this so that you can get a good idea of everything that's going on. You're going to be doing each one of these exercises five times. Athletes doing big circles forward, they're doing big circles um, backwards five times each. Little circles forward, little circles back, goal post, forearm touches, trunk rotation, and then golfer's rotation. On the next slide, so I'm going to go ahead and go to which is a little bit more specific. They do two additional ones as well, and that's doing internal rotation and then doing some form stretching. On this page, this talks a little bit about the research about the two-out drill. In the two-out drill, they did all, uh, for this research, they did all seven of these. A lot of times, we'll kind of cut out the trunk ones for the next piece that I'm going to talk about. A recent study in 2016, I think it was published in November, took a whole bunch of pro baseball players. We know about the external rotation that uh, pitchers and throwers are going to have more external rotation. We already know that. But what we haven't really talked about is that where the body pulls one way, it's going to lose in the other direction. That's the internal rotation. So what this study did is they took a whole bunch of pro baseball players. They had them go out and throw. They set a timer on their shirt for eight minutes. After eight minutes, they rechecked their rotation of both external rotation and internal rotation. They did it before throwing as well. What they found is, of course, there's more external rotation and a lost internal rotation. They rechecked it 24 hours later, and that loss was still there. So they had them go back. They did the same thing again. But after the eight minutes of throwing, they had them do this two-out throw, the one that you're seeing on the screen right now. What they found is that the pre-throwing range of motion was immediately restored doing the two-out throw. So, the muscular tightness from external um, rotation eccentric forces is what's causing that delay 24 hours later. So this is kind of a brand new study, but it's something to pay attention to. These are easy drills. It's like brushing your teeth. Why would you not brush your teeth if, if you knew you weren't going to get a cavity? If you do the two-out drill and there's a, um, a likelihood that you're not going to put yourself in an increased risk for injury, have your athletes do this. It's simple to be doing in the outfield in between throws. And you might start to see more players do this too um, on the professional level where they're starting to do some funky stuff out in the outfield in between throws. So this is a good drill to be teaching your athletes, um, having them do it after any kind of set, prolonged set that's throwing. Prevention, this goes, this is a big slide. I realize it looks big and scary. We're going to be talking about strength. I felt like I wouldn't be doing justice if I did not bring up George Davies. George Davies has done a ton of research for physical therapy on strength in the shoulder. He coined the term Davies 10. What he did is he looked at all the muscles, and he's done a ton of research on this, and said, these are all the muscles that function on the shoulder. These are all the important ones. This is how to strengthen. He brought 20, there's 27 muscles that directly function on the shoulder. 
he brought it down to, let's do these 10 exercises. He broke it into four categories, total arm strength, scapular thoracic strength, rotator cuff rotation, and collateral femoral strength. We're not gonna go over this whole slide. I just wanted to bring it up to show you how many different um, muscles actually really function on the shoulder. So then Kevin Wolf, who's also a physical therapist, said, let's make this specific to throwers. And it is very similar to some of the stuff that you saw on George Davies' slide. However, he added a couple extra things. It's important to have some good wrist function and elbow function as, as a throwing athlete. He added muscle um, exercises for that. He also added combined diagonal patterns. These are called PNF patterns. Um, if you're a curious for PNF, it's probably going to break your heart to see me put D2 on there or D1. But there's different terms that you might see out there for these exercises. And what it really is, is it's three combined motions together. So it's flexion, abduction, external rotation, going back into extens extension, internal rotation, and adduction. You might have seen this um, as chops or reverse chops is another way of saying it. We'll go over these exercises with pictures, I promise, so that this is not just one big blurb. Um, other things to note about the Star Wars Temp program is it's really not 10 exercises because you're doing both. You're doing wrist flexion and extension. You're doing elbow flexion and extension, so it's really more than 10 exercises, which can make this a little scary. Like, how am I supposed to practically get this all done for my athlete? That's where this slide comes into play. So what does this actually practically look like? If we were to break this down and make this something that you're actually supposed to do with your athletes, let's take the amount of time it's going to take to do it. On here, I put 15 minutes. I think we can even get this down to 12 or 10. It's going to be 12 stations. They're going to be a minute each. After every four exercises, you're going to take a break for 30 seconds and do the two out throw. I put two coaches supervising. If you have more than that, that would be even better. If you only have one coach on the team, you're a little, little league coach, and this is your first year doing it, maybe have a responsible parent help you out. Um, my recommendation is two times a week, you do it at the end of practice. I like this bottom picture. This is a group called Crossover Symmetry. It's by no means a plug for them, but it's just so that you're aware that there are different resources out there that you can use. This particular group has a whole bunch of bands that they attach, that attach to fences. You could easily do that and brought some different pieces of equipment in with different types of TheraBand. I know TheraBand is not as glamorous as big heavy weights, especially for some of your older athletes, but there is some big value in TheraBand. Why? Well, you can actually bring the joint up into one position and then work on the eccentric control coming back because you have resistance kind of going in both ways. And you can bring it anywhere. So you can easily attach it to a fence. Uh, the one I have here has a clip. You just clip it right on. Put it on the back stop. You put each of your stations. It's quick. It's easy. It's cost efficient. So you do your dynamic warm-up. Well, if it's at the end of practice, you've already done this. And then you have each set of your four different stations. In the first station, you have your bands at the fence. You're doing scaption. Scaption is just coming halfway in between um, a jumping jack and a forward flexion. I really like doing alternating reps with single arms versus doing both at the same time because I find that uh, athletes tend to raise their shoulders up if they're doing both at the same time, especially if they're not strong enough yet. Um, so I would recommend starting with alternating um, patterns. Your external and internal rotation. I have a whole separate slide on different ways to do internal and external rotation that we'll get to. But you can easily attach a band to the fence and do these. In the picture that is at the bottom of this slide, it shows some very high level external rotation. This is not something I would start first thing off. It's important to note that you want to progress exercises so that your athletes are still interested and engaged. But you don't want to make them so hard that they're compensating and have injuries. The whole point is to prevent injuries. So you want to make these something that um, you can observe proper form for and that your athletes feel somewhat challenged by. On a scale of 0 to 10, they should be at a 4 or 5. They shouldn't be at an 8, 9, or 10. Um, the cheerleader exercise. We'll go over this. That's that combined pattern um, or PNF patterns I talked about. You can also do chops or reverse chops with the band. The next series are doing different exercises uh, using some light hand weights. 
you can easily do these on the bleachers. Um, we'll go over those two in a little bit more depth. Some of these exercises, so triceps and biceps, um, I included some lower body stuff with. I talked about earlier it's important to do lower body strengthening as well. Why not do a two for one and get both at the same time? Do a bicep curl while you're doing a squat. Do a tricep press while you're doing a step up. It's an easy way to kind of get those exercises in together and it doesn't become quite so overwhelming looking at a chart where it says you have to do these 10 exercises. Um, lastly, there's a couple additional exercises in there that I think if you had to cut down on, you could move them to different parts of practice. And that would be uh, your wrist and elbow function, uh, wrist and elbow strengthening exercises. Uh, the exercises that I put on there are using a back. So you can easily do these in the dugout. Pronation and supination, depending on where you hold the back, you're going to have more or less resistance. So the further away you are, the harder it's going to be. Holding closer, it's going to be easier. But having your athlete maintain a neutral wrist and just do reps back and forth. You can have them do this in the dugout. It's pretty easy. You don't necessarily have to have that be a designated station. The other one is wrist roll-ups and then going down as well. That's where you're getting your wrist flexion and extension. You could tie a weight to the bat and get a little bit more resistance with it. Again, something you can easily do in the dugout. So let's go into a little bit more depth for some of these exercises. Your diagonal patterns. Um, the top picture. Sorry for the The top picture shows uh, an athlete using a side back machine, but you could easily do this also with a uh, bear band attached to a fence. Sorry. Does anyone have any questions at this point while we're uh, answering the phone? I think we're going to just keep going. Um, so, another way to do diagonal patterns is called a cheerleading exercise. <laughs> this is borrowed from my final site, um, but it's three different motions. So, you get, again, it's a two for one one. You're pulling into shoulder abduction, coming back to neutral, going into a full diagonal, which is flexion, abduction. Hopefully, you're getting extra rotation that might be a little hard. Coming back down, doing the opposite direction. Again, you're not letting the band snap back like this. <laughs> Thank you, Chrissy. You're letting it. it. <laughs> you're letting it slowly come down together. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, this is called the cheerleader exercise, but one rep would essentially be going out, going up and across, and then going in the opposite x direction. So this would be another way to kind of get your diagonal patterns in. Rotator cuff strengthening. Um, I think this sometimes can be misunderstood that more is better. So there's a lot of different ways you can do external rotation and internal rotation. It's what really is allowing us to throw, and it's something that we should be paying extra attention to when it comes to mechanics. Um, if you're noticing a, an athlete is raising their shoulder up like this, they're noticing that they're really arching their back, both upper back or lower back, they're probably not doing the exercise correctly. So there's nothing wrong starting with them down in neutral. I would recommend you put some sort of pillow or roll here and that they're not going like this because that becomes a whole different exercise. So they're here at neutral coming into external and internal rotation. That's what you see in the first two pictures up at the top here. You can also do it just external rotation and then you're getting some eccentric work coming back by doing the pull aparts, which is seen in the bottom left picture. Now the top picture would be your internal rotation with the band coming at 90-90. In this picture, the person's doing it with one arm. That's where I'd really recommend um, you, you start if you have an athlete that can easily do internal and external rotation. Um, you attach the band to the fence. You can even have them do it in a stance um, pose, and you're having them come down. You can have them come down and do a punch as well. There's different ways you can do this. For external rotation, you can have them do an extra row and come back. I would recommend starting with one arm and not going straight down to that bottom right picture and going into double goal pose. That's a great exercise if you have the strength to do it. I was recently talking to another therapist who um, is treating an athlete, not with baseball, it's another sport, who their uh, coach decided it was a good idea to do goal post 
which is that exercise, with 15 pound weights. This was an athlete who was perfectly healthy going into their sport and now has a, a shoulder impingement and they're doing an MRI to rule out there's something else. So this is a colleague not here somewhere else. But it's important to note that we want to make sure we're not causing more injuries. These are things that you should be doing with safe mechanics. Don't have them go to a double goal post if they're not ready. Little humoral strengthening. So the top picture is a fun one. We call this the chicken wings. You have your weights, you're going into horizontal abduction and coming back down. Again, you're not going like this, you're not going like this, you're coming straight in the same plane of motion. I'm only using two pound weights, I brought green and not my pink or purple, um, just so I could look a little stronger. But you don't need a whole lot of weight for this. You could do this with a band too, but two pound weights are easy to bring along. You can even have your athletes just fill up water bottles for this. It's not that much weight, but it's incredibly effective. Again, I have the scaption exercise I already talked a little bit about. You can do this with a band as well that's attached to the fence. Lastly, this is a great home exercise. I don't think I would have a player do this on the field, but that's lying on the side and doing external rotation and sideline. That is one of the thrower 10 exercises. However, it's not practically something I'd probably be able to do on the field, so that's why I left it off. Scapular thoracic strengthening. This is really where I feel like you should be spending your most effort. Why? Well, so the scapular thoracic joint is um, often doesn't get the attention it deserves. We sit a lot during the day. High school students, junior high schools, sit a lot during the day, and they don't always sit with proper posture. And as I'm saying this, I'm like instantly being like, I need to stand up a little taller since you're all watching me. Um, so we need to be giving those muscles the endurance strengthening exercises that they really deserve. There's a ton of different ways to do this. In the picture, you see the guy at the very top on the left doing this prone. He should have a towel roll underneath his forehead. I don't really think that it shows that because everything is white and it looks like he's just floating. But supporting the head, you're coming back into a T position. We call these Ys and Ts. So you can be doing it up in a Y position like you're doing the YMCA and back in a T position. If you can't do it at the same time, doing one arms, which is what I'd recommend doing at the field. You go to the bleachers, and I have a ball here too. You go to the bleachers, and you're just doing um, one hand on the bleacher. You can have one knee on the bleacher as well. You can do a row. You can do a Y. You can do it with light weights, holding three to five seconds. You come out and do your team. So really easy ways to do that. If you want to add a little additional challenge, but also get some impact through the opposite arm, you can add a Swiss ball and do it. So now there's a little bit of instability. Again, really basic exercises, but they deserve some good attention. In the picture, in the bottom right, it has some athletes doing it um, with a band. These are higher level exercises, so I wouldn't jump straight to that. You could do that eventually if you have um, a particularly strong athlete who's demonstrated that they can do these types of things and have the strength to do it. I also recommend just going um, prone or going on your belly on a Swiss ball. A Swiss ball is a, is a great way to kind of get some uh, postural stability as well. It's unstable surface, so you're adding some core stability at the same time. The last picture on the bottom left, this looks kind of like a tricep dip, but it's not. So one of the exercises that was recommended both by Davies and Wolf is what they call a press down. And what that is, is you're pressing through a surface um, and you're bringing the shoulder all the way up to the range of motion and you're pushing all the way back down through it. So in that picture that I have um, on the slide, the person is doing this with their elbows straight. So you're really getting some good contractions um, through your traps allowing the shoulder blade to work on some of that stabilizing force versus just working on upper rotation or external and internal rotation. So you're working on getting the shoulder to be able to press, to, de to depress, which could be important for a lot of different mechanics. Um, total arm strength. So this is the place that people tend to immediately jump to. They want to do their biceps and they want to do it with big weights. Well, there's a lot of other ways to do these. Um, I showed in the top picture someone doing this a bicep curl on one leg with, with the Theraband. This could be a way to challenge your athlete. You can work on their balance at the same time. 
with a TheraBand, it's going to snap back down to the ground or snap back to the fence if you don't accurately um, slowly bring it down. Eccentric bicep activity would be something that would be beneficial to work on with your athletes. The biceps um, play a huge role in the shoulder. So being able to eccentrically control it coming down versus just working on those curls would be a good exercise to do. For triceps, I put a single leg deadlift on there with a tricep press. So again, getting those two for one exercises. I like the TRX for doing bicep curls and triceps as well. That's another portable device you can bring to the field and clip onto the fence. Hopefully the fence will be strong enough. Just again, safety precautions. Push-ups. Everybody loves to do push-ups, right? Um, the problem with push-ups is not everybody does them well. You get a whole bunch of chicken wings. You ideally should be keeping those triceps and the elbows nice and tight by the rib cage. So no chicken wings. If an athlete can't do a really good push-up, don't have them do it. Have them do a wall push-up. There's nothing wrong going with a wall and just practicing form. It's still a great workout. Having them do it on an incline, on a bench, on the bleachers. Once they show the basics, then you can get fancy with stuff. You can give them a ball, you can give them a bow suit, you can give them a ton of different things, which we're going to talk about next. But really make sure they have sound mechanics first. A plank is also a great um, core stabilizing exercise that you can give them to start with and then start to add the um, arm motions with. We've talked about this throughout uh, the presentation tonight. I'm not going to get into too much depth on each one of these exercises, but doing some lower body and core exercises, doing your squats, doing your single leg squats, bridges, planks, hamstring curls, clamshells, split squats. These are all things that you can do um, pretty easily. About half of these exercises are body weight exercises that you need no equipment for. You don't have to lie on the ground, you can just do on your own. So things not to do. This slide's a little bit misleading. There is red and there is yellow. The top three are red. These are things I say, please do not do. Do not have your athletes do. The bottom two are more like, okay, this is kind of more of a yellow light sort of thing. The sleeper stretch used to be given a lot. And these young athletes, um, most likely they don't have posterior capsular uh, tightness. And so this is kind of putting the shoulder in a more compromised position. There's better ways to stretch. So I recommend not doing this stretch. The empty cam position. That's where the thumb is down versus up. It causes a ringing out effect on the shoulder and really puts it in a compromised position. So please don't do that position. Lat pull downs are great. Just don't put the bar behind your head and put the shoulder out in front of it. Um, this goes for bench press as well. Puts the shoulder in a very vulnerable spot. That's why the bench press is in yellow. Um, it's not that you shouldn't do a bench press but use good precautions, actually like a floor press better, where you're doing a bench press and your elbows are stopped by the floor versus having free range of motion to go all the way through, because you're not gonna put the shoulder at a compromised position by having a hard end stop, stopping point. Lastly, overhead lifts. Um, I like this picture because it shows precisely why you need to be precautions with overhead lift. I'm guessing this is some sort of overhead athlete looking at um, the asymmetry between the two shoulders. You can see the bar is dipping. You can see there's different curve. You can see there's different range of motion. If we have an athlete that already has those things, don't have them then put weight overhead because we're just creating an overuse injury and more risk to the shoulder joint itself. Baseball is an asymmetrical sport, meaning you're supposed to have one side that's a little bit stronger, a little bit more mobile. It's not going to be a mirror image left to right. We want to recognize and appreciate that. That's why many of these exercises I'm telling you to do one at a time versus at the same time. Um, we want to honor and respect that, but at the same time, things like the overhead lift, if you can't do it safely, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Dynamic activities, which is, includes plyometrics and proprioceptive activities. These are important things. Um, proprioceptive exercises are dynamic stability. So it could be something like, this looks really funny. The body play. Yes, this looks like something you bought off of the internet or on TV late at night um, on one of those infomercials. But this is a good way to kind of teach the shoulder or the elbow to respond to small amplitude motions. Um, it's good for endurance. Those types of things are great. So make sure you have foundational strength first. 
there's other ways to do this as well. Closed chain exercises like doing a push up or doing a plank on a BOSU bow ball. Doing plyometric exercises with a ball. Bouncing it against a uh, rebounder or doing different throwing drills. Again, you need to be strong enough to do that. One of the exercises we like in the clinic is going to a wall, going into the late hawking phase of the throw and doing small little motions. Working on some of the endurance um, at the shoulder, working on some of the dynamics between both the muscles in the front of the shoulder and the back of the shoulder. And these are some of the benefits in doing those types of things. So here um, at the Sports Medicine Center for Young Athletes, we have an injury screen and a return to play protocol. This was developed by our senior PT in Walnut Creek, Tom Clinnell. So thanks Tom for letting me borrow some of your stuff tonight. Um, we go through a kind of a rigorous process to make sure our athletes are healthy before we release them back to play. These would be athletes who come to us, they have an injury, we've been rehabbing them for a while before we allow them to go back. This doesn't mean that we couldn't see an athlete who is not injured at the time. If you are an athlete and you want to make sure that you are using sound mechanics, we do have a motion lab and uh, we do have some different things in the works that we would really like to develop further for our baseball players. So we are open to helping you even if you're not injured. What our injury screen and return to play entails is we want to make sure that subjectively we're not reporting any pain. So we have you do some subjective scales. We have you do a wide balance test and that's a lower extremity, uh, lower extremity test to see balance between your right and your left extremity. We have a different test that we look at your range of motion. We want to make sure you have adequate range of motion in the shoulder and in the elbow. For strength, and that's, the strength is really the big piece. We want to make sure that you have adequate strength, and not just adequate strength, but you have balance between um, the different muscle groups that control your shoulder and your elbow. So we look at external rotation and internal rotation, and we measure it against your body weight as well. And the reason we do that is we want to expect an athlete who's 100 pounds and 150, another athlete who's 150 pounds, to have the same amount of strength, it wouldn't make sense. So we look at it against your body weight, and then we look at the ratio between external and, and internal rotation, your decelerators and accelerators. We also look at your scapular strength. Scapular strength, again, is that endurance piece. We do the strength both before and after. We test you with some functional tests. So we test the strength, how we do a whole bunch of functional tests. We come back and we test you again, really because we want to see how you do with fatigue. So at this time, I'm going to just kind of conclude everything. Um, rather than have you look at my conclusion slide here, which just kind of, I'm going to talk through some of this, I want to give you um, the different works I used for this presentation and then go over the resources for coaches, players, and parents. So the conclusion of all of this is I hope that you know what the different recommendations and risk factors are given by the experts in the field. I hope that you have a better understanding of how important mobility, stability, and dynamic stability are in making sure an athlete is healthy. And I hope you're able to understand the different signs and um, symptoms of fatigue and overuse so that you can better identify it in your athletes and players. Um, this is my contact information. I work with wonderful colleagues at all of the different sites. So even if you're not in the Oakland area, I'd be happy to direct you to someone that can help you. We also have wonderful coaches that help us out all the time. Jeff Pick, who's in Arenda, has helped us with our return to throw. Um, we have some coaches that we've worked at, worked with with some of our ATCs as well that have some great um, throwing programs. So please feel free to contact both myself or anyone else um, within our network so that we can help you. The last four different um, contact informations are things that I used throughout today that have free brochures and information for any coaches, parents, or players to hand out, and it includes the pitch count and the different recommendations and risk factors. So at this time, I want to both thank you for listening in tonight and hanging in with me. I know it was a long hour, but I also want to open up for any questions. Oh, and I also want to add, if you would like copies of this presentation or parts of the presentation, 
um, there's a particular slide, you're like, I really have to have that. Please email me and I'm happy to share. Doesn't look like there's any questions. Thank you for presenting this evening. Thank you. And thank you everybody for tuning in online.